Well, let's get into our panels now. I'm going to invite up our panel members uh, to come up uh, and join me at the, at the table up here. Uh, Gwen Holdman, uh, Mira Kohler, and Ethan Shutt. Um, as they make their way up here, I'm probably going to just, just try and make up some time, introduce uh, the first speaker, which will be Gwen. I don't know if you knew that. But you did? Okay. So um, Gwen is a director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, which is an applied energy research program based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, focused on both fossil and renewable alternative energy technologies. Prior to joining the University of Alaska, Gwen served as the vice president of a new development at China? China. A uh, hot springs resort near Fairbanks. While at China, Gwen oversaw the construction of the first geothermal power plant in the state. She holds a degree in physics and mechanical engineering. And so our first session is focusing on, um, where's the uh, renewable, no, where's my thing here? Oh, I misplaced it. I have it right here. You've got it. Right. So, welcome, Gwen. <laughs> thank you, Gary. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to come here, and thank you so much, Gary. You know, I, I really want to um, commend the University of Saskatchewan, and, and in particular the um, School of Environment and Sustainability and, and Greg Pelter for really your vision in pulling together this symposium and, and leading this concept of um, of really bringing people together to share knowledge and share experiences around this particular um, area. That I think that there's a, a huge opportunity um, to learn from one another and to make improvements in our northern communities, in our remote communities, our indigenous communities, um, all across the north and really um, uh, globally. This isn't, I think, just a northern challenge. And, you know, I want to mention in particular Greg. I met Greg. Uh, Initially, we were both Arctic Fulbright scholars together. In fact, I think there's another, I see you, Laura. <laughs> One of our other um, uh, uh, Fulbright scholars from the, um, from the energy group, and Greg was the leader for the energy group. And we spent a lot of time talking about um, renewable energy development around the Arctic and, um, and really uh, where there was an opportunity for this group of scholars to work on policy recommendations. That was really what we were tasked with as a group of scholars. What kind of policy recommendations can you make um, in this particular area? And renewable energy was sort of the, the theme that, that we, this group had selected. And um, what we realized is that there's real disparity between experiences in the circumpolar Arctic when it comes to renewable energy development. In many ways, the Arctic region is actually the global leader when it comes to renewable energy development. About 45% of power and a huge portion of um, heat uh, in the Arctic is, is derived from renewable resources. And you have countries like Norway and like, um, like Iceland, for example, really leading the way with almost 100% 100% essentially of power generated from renewable resources. Uh, then you have a, a really different story when you start to look at our more remote um, communities. And I, I think I have a map here. I don't know how uh, visible this will be to all the members in the audience, but this is a, a picture of the circumpolar Arctic. This is actually something we worked on uh, through the Arctic Fulbright program, is really just kind of trying to quantify the electric grid and the different challenges that people face in the Arctic region. And so the grayed out area uh, in the outer portions of the map, that's the, re the national grid that, that, um, that we see uh, and on both continents, on all continents there. And then you've got the darker gray areas that are regional grids. So like in Alaska, for example, we have a large regional grid, the rail belt grid, and we'll probably hear a little bit more about that from Ethan. And, um, and then we have a lot of off-grid communities or remote communities. There's a lot of different ways that we name these sorts of places, but really what we're talking about, those, all those red dots around the circumpolar Arctic represent um, about a million and a half people in about 1,500 communities that are not connected to the rest of their country via transmission lines or pipelines. And so their energy is produced locally and it needs to be consumed locally. And this creates a, a much more significant challenge when it comes to developing renewable energy projects. And so even though the Arctic region as a whole is a leader in renewable energy development, I would actually argue the global leader in renewable energy development in the eight countries that make up the circumstances. 
and polar Arctic. When it comes to these remote communities, we're almost 100% on fossil fuel. There's, there's, there's exceptions for sure, and we'll hear about some of those today, but we're talking in the low single digits in terms of um, the amount of renewable penetration for our remote communities. And so as we worked um, through this Arctic Fulbright and looking at policies, we really recognized that focusing on remote and indigenous communities was really where there was the most opportunity and really the most need because the energy costs are very, very high in most of these places. There was also really a lack of knowledge sharing and, and exchange of ideas and expertise in this area uh, across the circumpolar Arctic, because frankly, it's very difficult. If you go from Alaska to Greenland or to Nunavut, it takes you two days to travel, essentially. And so it's not so simple to get people that are practitioners in one place talking to practitioners in another place. And so we really felt that it was important to find ways to exchange ideas and information. And this symposium and this um, proposed partnership is really one major step in that direction that we think is really critical to trying to make sure that projects of the future really benefit and learn from the lessons that have been learned from projects that have already been developed. And so with that being said, the, the, first, the theme of this very first um, panel is really to talk about, uh, talk about a lesson that's from Alaska and share some of our experiences with you. Um, I'm going to just provide some high-level context, and then I'm really, I, I know you'll be providing an introduction for Mira and Ethan, but I really have to say that, uh, that, that, uh, that the university did it right. They brought up two of, um, two of our real leaders here, and actually there's a number of other Alaskans here in the crowd as well that we'll be hearing from later. But um, I think Mira and Ethan in particular, I'm very excited to be with them in this panel because you know, they are, um, Ethan has really been involved in leading the way in terms of uh, uh, indigenous Native Alaskan owned project that's an independent power producer feeding power onto our grid. And so he really has that perspective. Mira um, has developed, has, um, we'll hear a lot about her communities, but she serves a large number of remote communities and she actually uh, runs more wind farms, not, not only than any other utility in Alaska, but any other utility company in the United States as well. Are you still going to let me claim that? I, <laughs> I, think, I think this is true. So, um, so anyway, I'm not going to, I'm going to just provide a little bit of context. Um, you know, all of the people in this room, I think, are fairly familiar with the North and understand that, uh, that our maps tend to distort uh, geography a little bit in the north and so Alaska is really a very large uh, place and so that really creates challenges for someone like Mira that has you know utilities and remote communities all over the state this is a huge geographic area that we're talking about and um, and there's a lot of challenges associated with that so I'm going to go through a few of those um, these are realities for Alaska but I think that you could replace this with northern Canada and a lot of these also translate very well to other remote places all over the world uh, high energy costs, the electric power um, costs in Alaska range dramatically for our remote communities. Um, for some of the larger ones that maybe have renewable energy resources like hydro associated with them, the costs can actually be low, even lower than 25 cents. But then in some of our communities where you have fly-in fuel, they can be much higher. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I know Mira will provide some additional context. Um, we do have this rail belt grid. So we do have one uh, single larger regional grid in Alaska. And, but beyond that, outside on the outskirts of that, we have about 200 or 250 communities that are not connected to this main grid. And our grid is not connected to Canada or to the rest of the United States either. Harsh and changing climate. Um, Alaska has a huge degree of variation in terms of our climate from, uh, tra from temperate rainforests in our southeast to, you know, high Arctic conditions, you know, on our north slope. Uh, but we are seeing in all parts of Alaska impacts related to climate change. This is a graph from my hometown in Fairbanks, Alaska, where we've seen an increase in measurable frost-free days. So our growing season has increased by 50% over the last 100 years. And this is just measurable data on frost-free days um, throughout the season. Uh, this is an example of coastal erosion that we've been dealing with in some of our western communities. And that's not really the purpose, but just to provide some context. We're at the end of many supply lines, not just in Alaska, but in many places in the north. So this makes us pretty vulnerable to disruptions in those supply lines, not just for things like uh, fuel deliveries, but also for food and all kinds of other necessities. 
Uh, many of our better renewable energy resources are not co-located with population centers, so this is a, a challenge. In fact, right now, one of the students from the University of Saskatchewan is at this site, probably um, soaking in that hot springs right now. This is a remote geothermal site in western Alaska that would be fantastic to develop, but it's, you know, 60 miles away from the nearest community, so that causes real challenges. And then a dispersed population, and so we have very small, this is actually one of your communities here, Mira. Uh, this is Teller, Alaska, and uh, so these are very small, uh, small population centers, and that um, creates a lot of challenges as well. So nonetheless, um, Alaska has been investing quite a bit in renewable energy infrastructure, and, and I want to emphasize that this investment has primarily come from the state of Alaska, although there has been federal and private investments as well, as, as Ethan will be able to attest to. Um, I'm going to let Mira and Ethan speak about specific projects, but I'll just show that about 70 of our communities have um, grid scale, so community scale renewable energy projects associated with them um, all across Alaska, and that uh, is across a wide range of different technology solutions. Um, wind energy has been a primary focus actually for both Mira and Ethan, but we do have a lot of other kinds of hydropower. Um, we have Clay Copeland is here in the audience somewhere. He's a utility manager. Clay, can you raise your hand? From Cordova, Alaska. He was introduced as the mayor, but you know, in Alaska, you wear many hats. So he also runs the utility company there and has um, actually manages two hydro projects there, for example. Uh, so I'm just going to put provide a little bit more context for about Alaska from a bit of a more kind of institutional um, standpoint. Uh, we are we do things differently than here in Saskatchewan. And I think it's important to understand that and kind of to provide a little bit of context. So not everything that we do in Alaska is transferable to other places and vice versa. And so really understanding sort of that um, kind of the policy underlying uh, renewable energy development is a little bit important. So Mira and I were arguing about this this morning, but we have a lot of utilities in Alaska. Um, I count 92. She thinks it's well above 100. <laughs> so, so there's a lot. We do not have one single crown corporation as is, as is common you know, here in, in the Canadian provinces and territories. And so that creates, um, that means that we have just a very, um, a, a very kind of, a lot of variety, I guess, in both how we produce power in terms of the management of utilities. Each one of these dots represents a single community in Alaska. I know you won't be able to see this, but I'm happy to provide the, these PowerPoints later as materials. But basically, um, what you can see here is that there are privately owned utilities, there are cooperatively owned utilities like Mira's, um, and then there are also municipally owned utilities. So we have a lot of different kinds of utility models. Uh, the energy, uh, the, the price for customers ranges really dramatically, but it's not necessarily based on what the management structure is. There's a, it's a very... Um, very kind of decentralized sort of utility model. Uh, can't, oh, our data, our performance um, and economic data is really readily available and it's easily accessible. Now, we always complain that there isn't enough data. You, I think that you can never have too much data. <laughs> but, um, but basically, in Alaska, what I found is that the data that we do have, like everyone kind of knows everyone else's business. Um, we know exactly how much Mira is paying for fuel. We know exactly how much her non-fuel costs are for every community, and you can compare yourself to another community and ask your utility company, how come those guys are paying less money than we are? You know, why is that? What's the deal? And you can get answers to these sorts of questions because we do have really well-published data. If anyone's interested in seeing some snapshots of that, we have an Alaska Energy Data Gateway that you can access and see all this data from any community in Alaska. Uh, I think that this is helpful because there, there's a little bit of, you know, if, you, if your utility is costing more for your customers than a neighboring community, you ha there's some accountability in that. Um, I can't even read my own slides. Uh, so, so, um, oh, the subsidy, yeah. So we have a very simple subsidy structure. Uh, we're not necessarily, it's not perfect, that's for sure, but it's, it's simple to understand and it only applies to residential customers and to community buildings. So anyone that's a commercial user pays the full cost of electric power and that means that things are economic. Um, there's not this market distortion and so um, things are economic in Alaska that might not be economic in other markets. So that's just something um, to point out. And two-thirds of those kilowatts that are sold in rural Alaska are not subsidized. So there's a, there's a real huge pressure in trying to reduce those costs and the fuel is a major component of that. Um, 
And so the policies and programs that have been developed to support renewable energy, um, and we talked a bit this morning about whether policy is a leading or a lagging indicator, you know, for many of these things. Um, in Alaska, most of those policies and programs were really designed from the, the grassroots up. It wasn't the government down kind of approach. It was the stakeholders like Mira and like Ethan, like myself and others that said, hey, we need these programs. We need um, things like the Renewable Energy Fund to really develop these projects. And so we're going to move that up through the political process and, and, and put those programs in place that we think we need. And so the Renewable Energy Fund in particular is how a lot of these projects have been at least partially funded. Uh, not all of them, but a, a good chunk of them. Uh, and so you can see this is just the first couple years of the Renewable Energy Fund being in place. There's this huge uptick in, in, in the installed capacity just for wind, wind, um, wind projects in the state of Alaska. Wind and hydro have been the two that have been funded the most. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, it's really about, um, I really can't read my own slides. Uh, let's see what it, okay. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's projects are community driven. And so that's actually one thing that I do think is important um, to, to point out that in Alaska, there isn't this uh, kind of culture of someone bringing a project and, and working with a community to develop it. They're really mostly developed at the community or the utility level. You know, that's really how projects are developed. And this concept of, you know, having the community engaged from the beginning, that's, the only, that's, that's how we operate in Alaska just because we have such a distributed market. And so it's really the people who are the ones at the local level that are driving this kind of change. And so this is just kind of some of the people that have been um, really engaged in Alaska. And so it really does come down to these project champions, these community champions that have really um, made things happen for, for our communities and for our state. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And uh, I'm going to call up uh, Mira. And I think what we'll do is we'll do questions at the, at the end. Uh, Mira Kohler is the president and CEO of Alaska uh, Village Electric Cooperative, a nonprofit utility serving about 11,000 meters and 32,000 Alaskans in 58 villages, home to more than 40% of Alaska's village population. Uh, Ms. Kohler has been a resident of Alaska since 1976, and her career in the electrical, electric utility business spans 38 years, mostly in rural Alaska. She's been the chief executive officer of three Alaskan utilities and has been at the helm of AVEC uh, since 2000. Ms. Kohler has a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in business administration, both from the University of Delhi in India. Mira? Thank you. <laughs> Having learned from Gwen, I decided I would bring my PowerPoint on my iPhone so that I can <laughs> see what I have up there. <laughs> it's always good to follow somebody and see what they trip on such as red font. Don't use red font in the future. <laughs> okay, well, I think you've already learned uh, a fair amount about our co-op, um, so I'm going to just sort of touch on a little bit more who we are, where we are, why we exist, and so forth. Uh, AVAC actually was started uh, back in 1967. It was an, a, a gubernatorial in a initiative to figure out how they could get central station service to remote villages. We had hundreds of villages that had no electricity for um, ever. I mean, they, they, were, they relied upon seal oil and coal lamps and so forth. And, and so we were formed as a co-op. And we're an unusual co-op because we consist of communities that are not connected to each other. They're, they're not geographically connected. They're not electrically interconnected. Uh, so they're all dispersed. So we currently serve 58 Alaska communities. We have almost 200 employees. Um, about half of them are full-time, half of them are part-time employees. Uh, they consist of technicians and administration and so forth that's based in Anchorage, which is Alaska's largest city. And uh, we typically will have two part-time employees in each local community uh, and some technical experts that are based in local communities and serve other communities, but mostly they come out of Anchorage. Uh, so we actually operate 50, 50 power plants. Um, that's a lot of diesel generators, about 170 diesel generators altogether. Burn a lot of diesel fuel. But we have a goal of uh, reducing our diesel consumption by 25% uh, within the next three years now. So I'm not sure we're going to get there, but you have to have goals, right? 
Uh, as Gwen mentioned, we do have a number of wind turbines. We have 34 wind turbines that are currently in 11 communities and serve another four communities. We are actually constructing two of our largest wind turbines that we'll have to date. These are 900 kilowatt machines that are going to serve uh, three additional communities. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how those go. They're under construction right now and will be in service next year. Um, and the most interesting one of those actually is going to be based in a small community of about 550 people called St. Mary's, which is on the Yukon River. It's about 25 miles away from uh, Mountain Village, similar size community, and we're going to be interconnecting those two communities and this single 900 kilowatt machine is going to be serving uh, those communities. Um, we expect to achieve 100% penetration uh, for a large amount of the year. We're working with Gwen actually, um, uh, hoping to get a project together to allow even better utilization of the wind than otherwise might be because the capacity of that turbine is actually 50% more than the average load of both communities connected. So it's going to be an interesting feat to see how that comes together. We do also have two PV projects, um, hoping to have more of those. Solar PV is becoming more affordable. It uh, doesn't have the best uh, uh, capacity factor in the long term, but it does have pretty reliable performance, and so we're getting pretty excited about it as it's, as it's coming down in cost. We're probably the only utility in the world that owns uh, two, two tug and barge vessels to deliver our own diesel fuel to our communities, but uh, that's something that we've been doing now for the last six years, and it's working out pretty good as well. So uh, Gwen showed you a map of Alaska over the lower 48, so we have to do that as well. Um, we do like to point out that if you were to cut Alaska in half, um, Texas would still be the third largest state. So you know we'd, we like to rub Texas's nose in the fact that they're really not that big. So Ethan and I were having a little discussion about the comparable size of Canada versus the United States, and it turns out that square mile wise, we're almost identical in size, but you're slightly bigger than us, so I don't know. I guess we're gonna have to annex a piece of Canada, so we're gonna be bigger than them. Those little golden dots on there show you where our communities are. Uh, we do have a recent addition right over here in, of Yakutat, so it's not on the map yet because my staff hasn't kept up with that. That just happened uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so we are actually in southeast Alaska, we're in southwest Alaska, we're in western Alaska, and we're in northwestern Alaska. And we even have uh, one community that's actually on the road system. That's the community of Minto that you see right up there, over here. It's about 100 miles uh, away from Fairbanks. It's a bit of a dirt road, but nonetheless, you can drive there. I wanted to show you what has been happening with our cost of power. Uh, and you probably have similar stories over here. This pink portion over here represents the cost of fuel. So you can see uh, back in this region over here when we had the very high cost of fuel, um, that our cost of fuel is running almost 40 cents a kilowatt hour. But this is probably pretty typical operating costs for any small uh, utility um, anywhere, I, I would say, in the country. Uh, it's about 10 cents a kilowatt hour to operate your generation system. It's whatever your fuel costs. Um, this is the depreciation figure over here in yellow. So that's amortizing the cost of capital. And then you have the cost of distribution, operations and maintenance, and you have administration, customer service, and all of that is clustered in about four to five cents a kilowatt hour. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what your costs per kilowatt hour are right now because the cost of fuel was lower last year. Our average cost of electricity is about 45 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, it's as low as 25 cents in our biggest community of Bethel, and it's as high as almost 70 cents in uh, a couple of communities where we have to fly diesel fuel in. This is a depiction of uh, the western part of Alaska. Those green wind turbines you see is where our wind turbines are uh, located. Uh, you can tell by the size of the wind turbine what the size of the Generation capacity is over there, so you have 300 kilowatts in Gamble, 200 in Savunga, 400 in Tuxuk Bay, and so forth. Um, and we've been doing this since 2003. Our first wind turbine uh, wind farm was built in 2003, and we've built uh, the other 10 since then. 
I wanted to give you a snapshot of what we're able to achieve in terms of diesel fuel displacement in the communities. I will be highlighting one of them a little bit later, and that's Shack Tulik. And you can see here that it's about 37% of our generation, our electric production is with wind. Um, I, I guess I should be honest and say that we have some communities where uh, we have very poor productions. If you look at Selawick, it's only 2.2% of our gross generation, but that was our very first community, and we have a generation of wind turbines in there that have not proven to be very reliable and effective. They continue to have operational challenges with them. But all of the others are essentially the Northern Power 100 kilowatt machine, and they've been pretty robust and reliable for us. Um, and on the bottom, I have Caltag. That's a 10 kilowatt uh, solar PV system. Very small penetration, but very important penetration because what it does for us is it displaces all of our station service and it also has marked the way forward for future uh, projects that I think are going to be looking a lot better than that. Um, looking at Shack Tulik again, uh, this is a very small community. Uh, it's less than 300 people. Um, the total diesel capacity is a little less than one megawatt and we have two uh, 100 kilowatt machines over there, uh, wind turbines. We only we sell a total of about a million kilowatt hours uh, in Shaktulik. It's actually one of the communities that is experiencing very severe erosion from climate change and is going to have to do something uh, in the foreseeable future to relocate or to do something different than what they're doing today. But as you can see, we have 200 kilowatts of wind capacity serving a community with an average load of 115 kW. So we achieve 100 plus percent penetration on a regular basis. The way we we're able to make it operate is that we have developed an in-house system to deflect the surplus electricity that's produced by wind generation. And we actually use that um, uh, to typically to heat water and sewer uh, projects or to heat schools. And uh, so we have a collaboration going with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, which has really been very, a very valuable relationship as we've both developed um, pretty sophisticated and very high functioning uh, heat recovery systems working on, on wind generation. Because one of the challenges with wind um, is that you still have to operate a diesel generator to be able to supply the backup power and reserve power for while that wind, the wind is obviously going to fluctuate greatly, demand is going to fluctuate greatly. And we, that, what that results in is that your diesel generation actually is reduced in efficiency because you are operating wind generation. So balancing the whole thing is a delicate affair. Um, this is the 10 kilowatt solar project I talked about. It's the Caltag solar project. It's pretty unsophisticated all manual. It has two positions. You have the winter position, which is straight up and down, and you have the summer position, which as you can see is about a 15 degree angle over there. Um, the capital cost was very high, $12,000 a kilowatt, but what we're experiencing today is more in the four to $5,000 a kilowatt range, so it really has become a lot more cost effective. And this is a picture of what uh, Solar production looks like on a, on a good day, a cloudless September day, and then you have the next day, and you can see that we went from uh, 58 kilowatt hours developed in, uh, or produced in one day to, to 36.7 kilowatt hours, or 0.8. So it is the vagaries of solar production um, that needs to be put, kept into, uh, brought into consideration. One of the projects that's happening, uh, has happened in Canada, that I'm very um, thrilled about, actually, is the Colville Lake project that Mike Oko's uh, North, uh, Northwest Territories has, uh, has built in Colville Lake, and they're achieving about a 50% diesel displacement with their hybrid system. The challenge you always have is the capital cost of these hybrid systems is extremely high, and how you're able to put the funding together to make that work is what really uh, determines what the success of a project is going to be. So what are the key challenges in our communities? Very small power plants, typically one megawatt or less, uh, very poor generation efficiencies because the small size of those diesel gen sets, uh, you just don't get those high efficiencies. So you can see in some of the very smallest communities, you're very lucky if you can get uh, 10 to 11 kilowatt hours per gallon, as you can see over there. Um, technical resources are scarce, uh, cost of fuel is very high, cost of storage is high, the environmental cost of diesel fuel spills and seeps is very high. Um, 
And then there's the basic lack of capital. Uh, what I have seen from standalone communities that are not part of the AVEX system is that uh, there are no resources, the resources aren't there to undertake a routine generator maintenance program. So all too often you'll have a brand new generator that's in service for three or four years and it fails because you haven't done your routine overhauls or you haven't changed the oil. And then all of a sudden you have a, you know, a massive expense to replace that generator. So you limp along for years on this uh, failure replacement cycle. And that's uh, what needs to be changed. And, and that's what AVEC does, is that we're able to break that cycle. Um, but it's not cheap. So we are connecting villages. Uh, we find that if we can connect two or more villages together, we get great improvements in efficiencies. Um, we're able to shut down diesel plants. We know that it costs about $150,000 a year to operate a diesel power plant. So if we can shut one down, not only did we quiet that community, we gave them a more efficient system. Um, we typically, they, the, the shutdown system typically has two sources of power. They have the tie line and they have a backup generator, a single generator in their village as opposed to three to four. Um, and we wind up with more efficient systems that way. So uh, one of the projects that we're working uh, with Gwen on at ASAP is looking at more cost-effective ways to connect communities. We're looking at uh, direct current as a transmission. Direct current is a very, very practical transmission alternative. The problem is that the cost of converting the power, uh, the stations from DC to AC and vice versa is extremely high. So our goal is to put together an inversion system that's going to be much less expensive than the current uh, multi-megawatt systems that are out there. So that's something that I'm hoping is gonna happen in the foreseeable future. Um, we're pursuing efficiencies, we're connecting communities, we're adding communities. We have added uh, three or four communities just in the last couple of years, uh, and we're developing the technical resources to look after our own systems. Um, and we do that by optimizing our own people and by developing the partnerships that we're here today for. Uh, this is a great partnership. I think working together, we can, we can move mountains. And with that, that's all I have, and I will yield the floor to to Gary and to Ethan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mira, and I'll have Ethan come up. Uh, Ethan uh, oversees Cook Inlet Regional Incorporated Land and Energy Developments, uh, the departments, including the exploration and leasing of those lands for oil and gas, mineral, and other natural resource development. He also directs uh, Cook Inlet's efforts in developing renewable and alternative energy projects. Ethan is Athabascan from Toke, Alaska. He joined uh, Cook Inlet in 2005 as general counsel. Previously, he was general counsel for Tanana Chiefs Conference in Fairbanks. Uh, he holds a bachelor's and juris doctor degree from, the, from Washington State University. Welcome, Ethan. Okay. Thank you all. A um, couple of quick comments on this things I heard today, I, uh, a couple of the uh, elder First Nations gentlemen who spoke this morning, it quite comforting to me, it actually sounds a lot like um, listening to similar leaders and elders from the communities uh, where I come from, so thank you very much, and just listening to you uh, provides comfort to me, so happy to be here. Uh, another one was uh, Gary's story about wildfire I have uh, very distinct memories um, of wildfires growing up. Uh, my community in Toke was evacuated for a major wildfire uh, while I was in high school. And so I remember distinctly how, um, you know, they are like a, like a living organism. They have very distinctive behaviors and they're highly driven by the wind to the point where when we came back the night after that wildfire, the fire had come right up to the edge of town and the wind changed and it moved out and it had it only burned two unoccupied structures. Um, but we ran out being in high school and we were very curious about all of this. So as soon as we were back, we looked and there was basically a, a right angle on the ground where the wind had shifted and it had come in from the east and then it went straight north. 
and you could see actually on the ground that shift uh, just off the edge of town. So uh, two very preliminary things, and then Alaska is very interconnected. I have a meter in one of uh, Mira's communities where my wife and I have a, a home, a, a vacation home or whatnot, where she grew up, and then uh, I've served on Gwen's uh, community advisory uh, board since uh, inception of her program. So, um, happy to be here. I'll talk a lot about Fire Island. I won't have any of the problems with uh, font because a lot of what I've done is uh, picture, <laughs> picture based. I uh, wasn't entirely sure what, what people wanted to, to see, so I, I left it pictorial and I'll do a lot of oral conversation and then um, we have a website and a Facebook page both with the project, so if you want data or more pictures, uh, that's available on, online. Uh, so Fire Island Wind Project, this is a, an aerial view from, uh, from the south, basically, looking back. Uh, the project's in the foreground on the island. Uh, it's an island that Siri owns, uh, almost the entire uh, island. There's a few federal inholdings uh, there still. And then Anchorage is in the background there on the um, ground in front of the mountains. Okay. Uh, CIRI um, is an Alaska Native Regional Corporation. It's how the federal government settled Aboriginal land claims in Alaska. Uh, there are 12 regional corporations. CIRI is one of them. Uh, you can see the kind of orange outline that's the territory uh, within which our Lands were selected. We have uh, seven villages and a couple of other smaller communities uh, and a couple of re um, urban communities that are within our region. Uh, Anchorage is within our home region, Anchorage being the largest community in Alaska. Uh, Siri has about uh, 800,000 acres of surface estate, which is the kind of darker blue color, um, probably a little washed out in the back of the room. And then the we have about a million and a half of acres of subsurface acreage. Uh, so in the ANCSA uh, system, there were village corporations and regional corporations, and wherever the village corporations own land, the region owns the subsurface below it, and then the regions also have uh, what are called 12 sea lands for the most part, which are joint estate where we own the surface and the subsurface. Uh, but that system was intended to centralize the uh, resource ownership for oil and gas, minerals, and other uh, resources within the regional corporation um, structure. So that's, that explains the two different colors of land. Uh, Siri had originally about 6,300 shareholders, uh, all of Alaska Native descent. It's quite different from the other 11 regions uh, in that you couldn't choose to enroll uh, in a regional corporation based on where you were uh, living, where you were from, or where you could trace your family's uh, heritage. And so by the time of settlement in the early 70s, there were many Alaska Natives living in Anchorage who came from other parts of the state. So two thirds of our original shareholders uh, are, for, are from some other uh, area within Alaska. So we represent all of the various racial and ethnic uh, Alaska Native groups uh, comprised in our uh, original shareholder base. And you can see some of that uh, even on our website with our board composition. Our uh, board of directors is, uh, has 15 members and they have, they, they represent a variety of different um, backgrounds, which is different. All the other 11 regions are much more homogenous. They're um, 90 plus percent often uh, from that same region. Uh, and so they're, they're much more like large family corporations uh, where series is just a bit different. Uh, now on to the Fire Island project. Uh, this is a picture of some of the turbines more down toward the southern end of the island there. Uh, these are turbines three, four, and five. Uh, there are 11 uh, turbines there, GE 1.6 models. Uh, the project was developed over uh, five or six years. Uh, we had, by the time of, we really got active in development, we had about uh, 10 years of data actually. Uh, so the project has 17.6 uh, megawatt nameplate uh, capacity. Uh, it runs at a, uh, about a 31% capacity factor. Um, we have a, 
uh, power purchase agreement with uh, Chugach Electric Association, which is the largest uh, cooperative electric utility in Alaska. It's one of uh, six, I, I like to refer to five, but there's technically six um, utilities on the rail belt in Alaska. So that's the grid that runs from Fairbanks up in the interior uh, down uh, through the uh, Madanuska Valley, Palmer and Wasilla, and down into Anchorage, and then ultimately down to uh, Kenai, Soldatna, and Homer on the Kenai Peninsula. So it's one uh, large grid relative to the state of Alaska. It's small relative to large grids here in Canada or in the um, continental U.S. Uh, so we have a power purchase agreement with Chugach. It was very difficult to obtain. It's also uh, highly unusual in its term. It has a perfectly flat uh, purchase price over 25 years. Uh, we're five years in. We sell power to them at $97 a megawatt hour uh, for the whole life of the project, which was a, a choice driven by our customer, not by us. It's a, an unusual uh, power purchase arrangement. Um, as far as that development, it's a very difficult project to develop. Had a number of different challenges. Um, the, Government in Alaska has chosen to support renewables almost exclusively through uh, a renewable energy grant fund that when oil prices were high was flush with cash and now is effectively empty. Uh, and they, it did project-based investment. But beyond that, there's effectively no uh, renewables policy incentive or mandate uh, in Alaska. Uh, we have a fractured and weak uh, regulatory system which does not provide a very effective tool for negotiating um, with our utilities, and so they don't really have any economic or policy or regulatory mandate, and so we had to find our way through that system and, and get a uh, power purchase agreement with Chugach Electric. Um, we we're successful in doing that, and the project has run well uh, now for five years. Uh, because of uh, its, its location, it's actually um, an interesting project because of, of where it is. It's, it's far north, it's not even the furthest north utility scale project in Alaska, but it is um, far enough north that we do have fairly extreme uh, temperature variations over, this, over the annual cycle. Uh, it is on, on an island, truly on an island. It's an island where the only uh, infrastructure uh, is the interconnecting transmission line, which was something we had to um, obtain funding for and then construct as a part of our project. But otherwise, it's unimproved access, um, so you can only access the island by uh, airplane or by um, barge for larger materials uh, or large equipment. Um, it does have an extreme tide cycle, so when I say it's only accessible uh, by those two means at the low tides, you can technically walk to the island. Uh, people do it. Uh, people die doing it um, because they get caught by the tide cycle uh, regularly, actually. Um, so we've, as operating the project, we have uh, rescued and returned several hikers who misjudged things. Um, uh, but because of that location, we're from, from the very uh, first part of the operation, we've been keen to uh, operation and maintenance of the project and have gotten out in front on best practices for uh, data collection and analytics for preventative maintenance. Um, if, if we had a major project, uh, major component failure in the winter, effectively what we have is an insurance policy for, for lost production and the turbine will be down until the spring if you lost a gearbox or blade or some other major component, uh, because those require, um, well, for one, they require large heavy replacement components, and for another, they require a uh, large crane. Uh, there are, we do not maintain any cranes on the island. Uh, we evaluated the cost of that, um, including both acquisition and the annual maintenance required for large cranes and didn't pencil out, so it's uh, more cost effective to just uh, wait until spring and bring them out on a barge. So because of that, we have a very uh, very keen sense of, of our operation and maintenance. Uh, we've done a, a lot of uh, innovative things, and our uh, project management staff um, participates in some online uh, forums with GE-based equipment. Uh, 
Uh, so the project itself, this is a, a schematic of where it is. Uh, it has two phases um, depicted here. The phase one is, is constructed and operating, uh, runs down to kind of the toe of the island at the southeast corner there. There are 11 turbines. Um, most of them are, are near the coastline, and then there are a couple of interior turbines. Uh, in the center of the island, you have uh, an O&M yard and a switchgear uh, yard, um, which support the project. The, the um, meter for measuring the energy output is at the switchgear, uh, and the, the uh, ownership of the assets, the electrical system assets, change at that point uh, to Chugach Electric uh, System begins at the northern side of the switch gear and runs down that uh, road in the middle of the island and then up at the landing strip on the northeast corner uh, it goes uh, subsea uh, so there's a subsea cable that goes to the mainland uh, and then it ties in from there to the uh, international substation at Chugach's uh, main headquarters and power plant. Um, project faced a number of, of hurdles in project development and permitting. Uh, one of the more significant ones was there was a FAA uh, navigational aid right in the middle of the project that uh, we had to relocate the first and to my knowledge only time has ever happened where a private contractor or private party uh, did the project development engineering financing and construction um, per FAA specs and then turned it over to the FAA at the end. So we relocated their um, navigational aid onto the Anchorage International Airport proper, which is where they normally live anyways. Uh, but that was a significant hurdle and one of the more uh, difficult obstacles to overcome. So with that, I'll run through some pictures. Uh, picture in the upper left was uh, typical of the uh, major component delivery to the project site. Um, barge delivery, this has particular load, has several tower sections and several blades, and the um, hub of the, of the um, blade assembly there. Uh, so they came in on high tide and uh, delivered their loads to the island, and then um, on the next tide cycle went back to the port of Anchorage and, and repeated the whole process. Um, on the right, you can see um, construction of the transmission inner tie at the subsea. Uh, it's a very difficult um, project because of the tide cycle and, and um, because of the nature of the material in that area. So you can see it goes basically completely dry at low tide. Uh, so the installation construction methodology was to trench with uh, low ground pressure typical construction equipment and then move the transmission line physically into the trench and actually at that point just let the normal tidal action put the spoils back in the trench. Uh, so there were two barges, one with the spools of the two cables and the other was the uh, construction equipment support uh, barge. And the final picture is the unloading of the transmission line that was fabricated in Europe and delivered to Anchorage um, putting that on the, the barge uh, there at one of the ports in the upper Cook Inlet. Um, just a couple of photos of the uh, typical wind, major wind turbine, utility scale wind turbine uh, foundation construction. Uh, they're large reinforced concrete cages uh, with the anchor bolts going down into them. So that's the upper left, and then the full cage ready for concrete in the center, and then um, a lot of the concrete in place uh, on the right with uh, final concrete being poured. Uh, hoisting the assembled rotor. Uh, so with GE machines, you assemble the full rotor assembly on the ground and, and hoist it as one unit, many some manufacturers, they, you install the hub and then you install the uh, blades on the machine in the air. Uh, but for GEs, you hoist them as one unit. So that's a picture of, of that exercise. Uh, graph of the life-to-date 
production of the project and uh, there are five colored bars in each month and most of what this particular graphic displays is the seasonal nature of our production. Uh, project produces most of its energy in the winter months. Um, big months are uh, November, December, January, February, typically. Uh, this year, life to date, actually, um, January and February were awful, very still for some reason. Um, so we're lagging our expected wind budget a little this year, but in typical years, we get uh, an awful lot of wind in the winter. It does correspond to the annual load uh, in the rail belt and in most of Alaska. Heavy load in the winter when it's cold and dark, and that's when our project produces most of its energy. Uh, and then there's just a couple of, of small uh, technical graphics. This is a screenshot of the SCADA system as we see it. Um, this is the home page. It displays the project output, uh, and then it has um, summarized on the left, and, and uh, each of the turbines has a, has a little green dot there on the left column, and you can click on that, and then there are a number of pages you can follow to see the, the technical specs of what's going on. Uh, or if they're in a repair mode because they've faulted, you can see what has happened and what the status of the repair is at some level. Uh, and then another screenshot of showing a, a different uh, output display where you can see the current output of, of each machine in the bar graph there uh, on the right. Uh, so I talked about operation and maintenance. Um, we contract the primary O&M function. We've actually just switched uh, that after initial five-year contract. Uh, we've just gone back to GE, uh, who didn't, wasn't particularly interested in O&M function at, for their own equipment even at uh, project inception, but now corporately has made a big push to get back into uh, O&M as a, as a provider, uh, particularly for their own equipment. Uh, so that we're actually in the transition now from the original O&M vendor to uh, GE, who's very excited, apparently, to get back into this project. Uh, so on the upper left, uh, we're doing um, blade repairs early this spring. We've had some leading edge erosion on a couple of blades, and we've lost uh, a couple of blade tips. Uh, so they hang down on ropes and do this work. Actually, the vendor we use for this work comes out of Quebec a small Canadian uh, outfit that specializes in this. Uh, they've done a wonderful job uh, two, two years now. Um, so we have those kinds of annual maintenance uh, functions, and we have more routine um, functions. The center picture is electrical. There, you know, there's a utility scale electrical system there, so a number of uh, checks and repairs uh, to be done there. Uh, and then on the left, there's a fluid change that I believe was uh, related to uh, pad mount transformer maintenance. There's, there's a cycle for maintaining the fluid levels in pad mount transformers, and that's a function that Siri uh, staff maintains. So we do all, all the balance of plant support, uh, which is runway maintenance and repair, uh, road maintenance, including snow plowing. Uh, we maintain the um, O&M facilities, and then we do the contracting for direct maintenance on the electrical system, everything beyond the turbine. Uh, and then one more pretty picture. This is right at the end of construction. You can see the large crane in the center just, just before they demobed that, tore it apart, and took it back to town. But all of the uh, turbines were constructed in, at the end of the project in 2012. Uh, again, Anchorage in the background. So. And then I'll leave a last, oh, this is, this is the iconic picture of, the, of this project during construction. Um, they're uh, across the inlet to the southwest, and a couple of the construction employees on the top of the nacelle as they're installing the rotor on uh, turbine number five. Um, so this, this is a picture that's been all over, especially in 2013 kind of time frame, right after the project was uh, constructed uh, because it is so photogenic, uh, interesting picture. Um, so just that pretty picture thing.
Uh, and then the, here's the contact information, including the uh, relevant um, websites and Facebook pages. Um, so Siri Beyond, this project has been an investor um, in other renewables and power projects uh, outside of Alaska. We've made a couple of other attempts uh, within Alaska, including an attempt to do a phase two of the Fire Island project, which so far has been un unsuccessful uh, for reasons I won't go into because it's a long story. Um, but we, we've attempted also to look at uh, project development in rural Alaska. We'll continue to do that. Uh, and then we have been an investor, not so much a developer of, of project power, uh, power projects in the continental US, uh, focused primarily on wind, uh, but we are also a major uh, equity investor in a combined cycle natural gas plant in Southwest Ohio. Uh, so we're active in renewable infrastructure and power development uh, in both, as both a developer of small projects and an investor in larger ones. So. Thank you for uh, having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come here. So we've got a, a few minutes here for, for some questions and um, there's a lot to digest there about the experiences um, our panelists have had with the real life implementation and operation of uh, renewables in Alaska and the success stories, but we also heard a lot of the challenges, I think, um, that they've encountered. So uh, any questions from the, from the audience uh, at this point? If you do, if we could have you go to the microphone and uh, jump in. Go ahead uh, to the microphones in the middle of the aisle here. Um, and then we'll go in the order as you get to the microphone. So. If you could state your name, um, and if you represent an organization as well, that'd be good. It should be on already. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kalpesh Joshi, from a researcher from uh, University of Saskatchewan. I'm working on a sustainable energy systems project with uh, solar photovoltaic generation and energy storage. I have a couple of questions to Mira. I, I just wonder how the local community is engaged in the initiatives of uh, Alaska Village Electric Cooperative, right? And a second question is, uh, is it that the storage is discarded till now as an option to extend renewables just because of the f costs involved or is there any other factor as well? Okay, so Thank your you. first question was the engagement level of the local community in project development. Um, that's a very important feature. For one thing, the placement of our um, projects is totally dependent on local knowledge and local support. Um, and we actually, unfortunately, do have situations where we will go through um, and we'll be doing measuring in a community and then we're not able to get the community to agree upon a site and the project shuts down. So we've had that happen on more than one occasion, but for the most part, communities are excited to be a part of a project like that. Uh, one of the challenges that we always run into is the fact that we have, uh, Gwen mentioned the power cost equalization subsidy. What that does is it flattens out the cost of electricity for a homeowner for the first 500 kilowatt hours. So they don't necessarily see on their electric bill the impact of a renewable project, but we're always able to promote a project on the basis of uh, commerce and school systems, particularly whose cost of electricity goes down dramatically. So um, local, local support is very important because they can kill a project if they're not engaged with it. And then I think your second question had to do with storage. Uh, we don't actually have storage in any of our communities. It's a very expensive uh, option. Uh, what we are looking at that we're developing with Gwen is what we call um, a grid bridging system. And that would be a, a storage, a large amount of storage for a very short period of time. So we're talking about the ultra capacitor type approach uh, that would allow us just the few seconds that's necessary to bring a diesel genset online. So that would allow us to optimize uh, diesel's off situation in the future. Next question. Hi, Kevin Hudson with Saskatoon Light and Power. Um, 
obviously in northern communities uh, uh, that are off-grid, your reliability would be also a concern. And I, I didn't see um, in any of your slides where you spoke to reliability, so could you just talk a bit about reliability and then also what are the consequences um, for your communities if they're actually out of power? The reliability, of course, is a key issue. I, we, I actually have uh, one of our communities right now where we're struggling with um, stabilization issues because it's a small community. We get 200 kilowatts of wind in there, and there's been a lot of, um, of, of swinging challenges. We have not actually experienced major impacts, particularly during the winter. Our concern is that we have reliability during the winter. Uh, we have to be able to have uh, very good access. Uh, obviously, you can't have power off for very long. Um, we, do, we do have more interruptions uh, on average than in a larger community in the lower 48 or in Alaska. But as a whole, our reliability is good. Uh, we experience per customer about a little less than five hours per year of outages. So, uh, so that, that is really pretty high. But nonetheless, it's two and a half times what the national norm is. But I don't think we can ever get to that level. So we have to be realistic about what's achievable and what's not achievable. Our communities are pretty tolerant. Uh, but what's happening is that as, as uh, electronic sophistication improves, people expect more and more reliable power. You know, um, they, they're, the tolerance levels that they can endure are very much closer than they used to be. But, you know. Those are, those are the things you just have to balance in the grand equation. Okay. Hi, Diane Hirschberg, University of Alaska, Anchorage. Um, Mira, you were talking about challenges, but one of the challenges that I um, didn't hear you address is actually the human capital challenge. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, what maybe the challenges you face and some of the solutions in terms of having technical skills in your communities. And that, of course, is very key because I, I think in one of my slides I point out that the average size of one of our communities is 400 people and the average load in that community is 140 kilowatts. Uh, so e local capacity, if you have you know, very technically competent young people, guess what? They want a full-time job somewhere else than in their village, so uh, they want out of there. What we have been able to do, however, is uh, recruit from within our power plant operators that we've had for many years, um, the ones that have you know, the inclination uh, and skill sets to be able to contribute at a greater level, we actually bring them in and make them full-time employees and then they become the mentors for other communities um, as we go along. We do have a full-time power plant operator trainer on staff and so uh, that person goes from community to community and spends time with every single operator one-on-one -on -one. so we do our own training um, which is supplemented by what's available through the university and through Avtech and Seward but for the most part, it's all our own training. We do have typically a windsmith in each village. So uh, in each village where we have a, a wind turbine, we will take that lo local power plant operator and we will send them in for uh, much more in-depth training so they can do 95% of the troubleshooting and repairs that need to be done in the community. But we maintain a full-time staff of two or three additional technical people out of Anchorage that support them and do the higher level maintenance. And then, of course, we also have to have uh, technical contracts with our suppliers to make sure that they're on the ball, too, uh, taking care of our issues. Thank you.